Oh, we're just going to go ahead and get started. First of all, thank you very much for attending. My name is uh, Jody Handley. I'm with Grape City Developer Tools. And you're attending a webinar on blogging for developers. I originally gave this during the dog food conference a couple weeks ago uh, where I met uh, Mike Bronstein there. Thank you very much for uh, attending again today. And I hope you uh, get, some, get some good out of this. So our presentation overview. First, we're going to go over fiscal and personal reasons to blog. Uh, next, we're going to be talking about what we can actually blog about, both evergreen and topical blog topics. Um, next, we're going to talk about writing for a conversational and compelling style, optimizing SEO through effective headlines and subheads and all of that good stuff. And lastly, we're going to talk about promoting your blog posts because it's important, obviously, that people actually know that you wrote something. So a little bit about me. I spent 10 years as an editor and collaborator on a few dozen books, uh, usually nonfiction, kind of across the board topic-wise. I also spent 10 years, some of that overlapping with the editor work, as a .NET developer for a global architecture firm. And that grew into being a product manager with that firm, which leads me today to being the product marketing manager of Grape City, which as far as I can tell is kind of a perfect blending of both being an editor, collaborator, writer, and a developer. And you can see here, these are our three main tools that we, tool sets that we sell, Component One Studio, Widgmo, and Zuni. So first we're going to talk about why marketing wants you to blog. Now, I'm kind of going under the assumption here that you actually work for a firm that has marketing. If you don't have a marketing department to annoy you into blogging all of the time, then at the very least, you should probably blog on your own. I just see a question here. Um, will there be a recording sent out? Yes, we are recording this and I'm going to post this to our website and I will let you all know as soon as it's posted. Thanks for asking. So let's get back to uh, why you ought to blog. So a couple of good facts from uh, many of them from HubSpot, which is a great marketing blog online. Companies that blog experience 434% more indexed pages. What does that mean? That means there's just more stuff out on the web. And that means that there are more chances for your website to show up in Google search. That means that you have a more frequent search ranking. And of course, more frequent search ranking means it's more likely that you'll have more visitors because companies that blog also experience 55% more visitors. We also have 97% more inbound links. What's an inbound link? That actually means that other websites are linking to you. So that means that other people think that your information is worth reading. And by the way, in case you didn't know, that also leads to 55% more visitors. That's why companies that blog experience 55% more visitors. That also leads to a higher search ranking because Google really likes inbound links. They look at that when they're looking at how highly to rank you, which of course leads to more visitors. More visitors also leads to higher search ranking, which leads to more inbound links, which all of this comes down to you get more sales leads, which uh, we can all hope leads to more business. A couple more facts here. Companies that blog at, uh, 16 plus posts per month, that's about four posts per week get three and a half times more traffic than those who blog fewer than once a week. So that's a pretty big deal. Uh, they also get four and a half times more leads than those who publish fewer than one post a week. That's even a bigger deal because leads directly lead to business. For companies with fewer than 10 employees, posting twice a week triples the site visits when compared with companies of the same size. So if you're a small company, especially if you're a consultant, this is huge. If you blog more, you're going to get three times as many site visits as a company of the same size that doesn't post quite as much as you do. Companies with 401 plus blog posts in total get twice as many site visits as those with fewer than 400. I find this really interesting and HubSpot uh, called this out. You can see on their graph that they're showing 301 uh, to 400 really being a tipping point at the 400 point. Once you get up above 400, you double your site visits. And by the way, when I talk about 401 plus blog posts, that means in the history of your entire blog. So that's going back historically. They also get three times more leads than those with fewer than 100 blog posts. So what does that mean? Start now. Start blogging now, and in a few months, once you get over those 400 blog posts, you'll see, you might see a sharp uptake in the number of site visits and leads that you get. 
So in review, why does marketing want you to blog? And I just realized the font here is a little messed up, so I want to apologize for that. You get more traffic, you get more leads, you get more business, and that compounds over time. I thought that I updated every slide of this, but I guess I didn't. So here's why you want to blog. You want to make a process more efficient. You've discovered some really neat solution and it's one that people keep asking you about. Maybe you're in support and people keep requesting the same issue over and over again. They're reporting the same problem that, that you already have a solution to. You can create a blog and refer people to that blog or maybe people will find that blog and they won't need to call you. You want to show off. Being a show off is not a problem. I like Miss Piggy a great deal. She's the best show off that I know. That's why I included her uh, picture here. Showing off is important. That's how you share knowledge because if you found a great solution and you want to help people, you're going to have to talk about it in order for them to know. Lastly, you might want to actually entertain people. Uh, there are a lot of blogs out there that are funny, that are amusing. BuzzFeed makes probably a good deal of money doing just this thing. It's not a bad thing. These are all good reasons to blog. Okay, so you've decided that you want to blog. Now you have to decide what you should blog about. Here are my rules of blogging. They're extremely complicated, so you might want to take notes. You know something. They don't know something. They should know something. And they want to know something. That's all. That's all, that, that's all the reason that you need to blog and what you should blog about. Here's the key. If they don't want to know something, they won't find you. And that's not a bad thing. Maybe you know, if they don't want to know what you know, there are probably going to be other people out there who do. So the ideal blog is evergreen. Evergreen blogs drive exponentially more traffic over time, and they continue growing an audience long after the initial publication. This is a huge deal. I'm going to share some statistics right now on evergreen blogs. Anytime that you hear people talking about compounding or evergreen blogs, what they mean is you could read it five years later. It's still going to make sense. You're still going to share it with people. It's continuing to grow an audience. A little bit more about evergreen blogs here. They produce 38% of total blog traffic. That is nothing to sneeze at, especially because only about one out of every 10 posts is actually an evergreen blog. And they get the same traffic as six decaying posts. Now, what's a decaying post? That's something that, well, it might be topical. It might be time-based. It's just something that people probably aren't going to go back to and share five years later. So 22 months post-publication, these evergreen posts get 3.4 times more visits than they do at publication. What's that mean? Their audience keeps growing. That is a huge deal. Evergreen posts equal free business. What does that mean? You've already invested the time. You don't even have to worry about going back and doing anything with that. Now, that's not, anything, that's not to say that you shouldn't. You can't look at an old evergreen post and see how you can update it. We'll talk about that in a bit. But that time is spent. So the four hours, because it might take that long, or even eight hours that you spend crafting this perfect evergreen post, that is eight hours that's going to keep coming back to you over and over and over again in the next five years. So how do we identify evergreen topics? Well, the first thing I would do is check Google Analytics. You can uh, publish an update on an old evergreen blog post. I had just mentioned that. And if you have a Google Analytics, uh, this I'm just writing here, how to get to it. If not, get Google Analytics. It's extremely useful on a variety of, in a variety of ways. But in this case, you can look at behavior, site content, all pages, and then you filter on your blog posts. And then you can look at the bounce rate and the time spent. If you have a blog post that's five years old and it's still getting hits, but it has a 90% bounce rate, it's likely that, that the people aren't finding what they need in that blog post. It probably means that for some reason that's optimized for a very common search term so people keep finding it, but that's not actually giving them what they want. However, if it has a, a reasonable bounce rate, say 65% and below, 40% is ideal, but even 65% and below, you might be looking at something that people are actually looking at and clicking through. And time spent. If people are spending three to six minutes on your blog post, that probably indicates that they're still reading it. So is there anything about that blog post that can be updated? Uh, can you repost something? One post uh, that we have on the component1.com website is called Creating Outlines and Trees with the C1 Flex Grid Control. Very exciting title. I'm sure you're all very interested in it. But it got 172 hits in the last month, and it has a 64% bounce rate. So that's not fabulous. Like I said, 40% is kind of ideal. But people spend an average of five minutes on that page, so that indicates that they're reading. 
Um, and a few, you know, create outlines and trees is a clear problem users might have independent of FlexGrid, which is our specific control name. So what that means is I went back to the original author and said, is there anything that we can update about this? Certainly can we make sure that we add a call to action at the bottom of this, and we'll talk about call to actions in a bit, to make sure that we're continuing to drive traffic throughout our entire site. So another way that you can find an evergreen topic is popular forum posts. If you find forums that have a lot of people hitting the same one over and over again, that probably means that it's a frequent search, it's a frequent answer. Figure out how to make a, a post out of it. Check support logs and talk to support staff. They're going to know about those forum posts. They're going to know the problems that people have most frequently. Talk to sales. When new customers are calling in, what do they ask about? Maybe these are questions that can be answered in a blog, or maybe it's more suitable for a blog than actually creating a new page on your website. Lastly, go with your gut. It's not going to hurt to try. You can spend a few hours writing a nice blog post, and it might take off. It might be evergreen. And if it's not, you know what? It's still more content. It's still something that you can tweet about. It's still something you can promote. So it's adding value to your site. So here are some topical blog ideas and a little bit about scheduling these things. Now, a topical blog idea is something that's more time-based. It, it may not be as evergreen, but it's still very useful to have on the site, both to let your current users know about it, but then also to have some content out there that people can refer to when they're looking for, say, roadmaps or what's coming up. Releases are my very favorite source of content. It's got a ton of stuff just baked right into it. You have lots of hit points there. You can do a couple of previews for your big things that you're releasing. You want to do an announcement the day of. You might want to do a couple of announcements the day, then the days immediately after, highlighting your big features that are coming out. Getting started posts are enormously helpful, and those can often be evergreen posts because if somebody is using your FlexGrid Two years later, they might still be able to go back to that blog post and get a lot of good information. And you can also highlight features. You know, you might not want to include every single barcode or uh, little bit of information that you've got everywhere in your documentation on your marketing website, but a blog post is a great way to highlight these things. If you're going to an event, you can think about posting the script for a talk. I've posted a, a blog post about this particular talk that we're doing right now. You can blog during the event if there's some exciting technologies or interesting talks that you visit. Lastly, I, or no, excuse me, not lastly, almost lastly, schedule a recurring meeting for yourself to work on blogs once a week. I do this every week. It's stuck on my calendar. Nobody bothers me on Wednesdays because those are the days that I am going through the blogs and trying to figure out what we can blog about in the next week. Lastly, if you're really put up for a blog post, you haven't put anything up in, the, in a week and you're not sure who else is going to be doing something, pick a random feature in docu documentation and put it in the blog. That goes with the highlight features and going deep. Find something that someone might be interested in, highlight it, call it a tip. That's a great way to go. So that's, that closes out what you can blog about. Next, we're going to talk about kind of how to blog and writing for humans. And this is one of the things that I try to, to really drive home as much as possible. Readers are people. We are all technical people. I assume that that's why you're attending something called Blogging for Developers. And it's very likely if you're selling a piece of software or control like Component 1 does, that you might uh, also be writing for a technical audience. That does not mean that they are not human beings. And you should write to them like they're people. So here's a quick pre-writing checklist that you can kind of run through and just say, am I hitting all of these things? Do I really understand all of the reasons that, I, that I'm writing this and why this is a good topic and why it's interesting to people? Why am I writing this? I mean, that's the first question that you should, you should answer. Am I trying to provide a solution? Am I trying to share something? Am I trying to stem off a question before it crops up again? What problem am I solving? I'm going to come back to this several times. This is my favorite question. I drive people to distraction by asking, what problem are we trying to solve? We've all been in this situation where someone brings a solution to us. And then when you dig a little deeper, you find out that their solution is not actually solving the problem. You want to actually find out the problem and then provide a solution for it. Why does the reader care about my topic? This is a good thing to know. Uh, how is my content different than content in other blogs or pages on our website, and how does it connect? You don't necessarily want to duplicate everything that's on your website or that somebody posted in a blog last week, but you want to make sure that you're connecting to it, that it's in the same series, or that you're not completely uh, blogging about something different 
that has nothing to do with your company, for instance. What's the single most important thing a reader can take away from my blog? This, if you don't know this, don't blog. You have to have at least this much of a focus. I know exactly the big thing that I want somebody to take away from this. And I'm going to tell you right now, the thing that I want you to take away from this presentation is what problem am I solving? That's my favorite thing. Secondly, your, writer, your readers are people. Beyond that, it's all gravy as far as I'm concerned. So you want to do the same thing for your blog. What is the single most important thing a reader can take away from this? And honestly, put that as close to the top as possible. Just like with a, new, a newspaper, remember those, people used to read those, above the fold is above the scroll. So make sure your single most important thing is above the scroll so that when somebody hops in there, you don't spike your bounce rate because someone doesn't find exactly what they need in that first paragraph. Okay, getting back to what problem are you really solving? I'm going to tell you a story. I call it the parable of the Antrilli florist. This is specifically about my uncle. My uncle is a florist. He sells flowers. He sells flower arrangements. So he was looking for a location for his, flower, his florist shop. Now, if he thinks about what problem he's trying to solve, the first answer that you might have is, well, he's trying to solve a problem for people who don't have flowers. He wants to make sure that they have flowers. Well, the thing is, if he wants to put his location near where people buy flowers, then he would put it near a nursery or a garden center because that's where people go to buy flowers because they're trying to solve a very particular problem that has directly to do with flowers. However, that's not the problem he was trying to solve. The problem he was trying to solve is that people want to celebrate or console people. And how do they do that? Often they do that with flowers. Traditionally speaking, that's a big thing that people do is they buy flowers for people when they want to celebrate or console other people. So he didn't locate his florist shop near a garden center or a nursery. He located his florist shop near three funeral homes, two churches, and a hospital. And that meant that it was very convenient for people to find ways to comfort and celebrate by using flowers. He has recently retired, actually, and I think that he even has a second shop open. He was very successful because humans search by problem. They do not search by solution. And this, is, this leads very... Uh, deeply into the SEO portion of this presentation, but also think about this when you're considering writing your blog. What problem am I actually trying to solve? Am I solving a problem for myself that I want to pe show people maybe how to use a cell template in my very particular control? Or am I trying to do something a little deeper than that, which is show somebody how to customize their grid, and it just so happens that a way to do that is by using the cell template in my product that I've got right now. Okay, so moving on, we next need to establish your post audience. And just a clue, the answer to who is your audience is never everyone. It is never, ever everyone. Pick one audience and write to them. So I have an evergreen blog post that I have on a personal blog that I posted five years ago when my daughter was screaming all night long and would not sleep. She was five months old. So I wrote a blog post about a particular method of getting your baby to go to sleep. And that blog post by far is the most popular on my blog. I have not actually written anything on my personal blog in about a year and a half. And that particular post still gets well over 100 hits a month. Why? Because it's a problem that people need to solve, and it's a problem that people need to solve desperately. And second, it has a very specific audience, exhausted parents who have tried multiple tactics to get their babies to sleep. Now, it might appeal to other people, somebody who's, I don't know, a child psychologist that's trying to read about what happens when people do crying it out. They might also find my blog and find it uh, interesting and, and get some use out of it. But my blog, I wrote very specifically toward crazy, exhausted people who are trying to get their babies to sleep. Find someone in the audience, whether it's Gonzo or Miss Piggy or Fozzie or whoever else you happen to be writing toward, and write only for them. If you get more than just them, excellent. That's gravy. But if you only write to them and they come to you, then that's achieving the goal that you set out to do. Secondly, we're started, starting to move into some writing tips. Empower your solution and the reader. And all of these uh, examples come directly from blog posts that I've edited. 
So this is one style that I've definitely seen a lot of uh, bloggers write, especially if they're developers themselves and maybe they don't feel entirely comfortable writing. But this is a style, just think about how this sounds. If you implement this code, you would see that it works. After deploying, you should find that the display changes. You could achieve this goal by inserting a new cell. And what this is saying to me is if you ever try it, it should work, which is kind of positive. But what you really want to do is empower your solution. I know that I'm right and empower your reader. I know that you're smart enough to do this. And by doing this, you use more powerful directions. Like you'll see that this code works well. I know this code is going to work well. After deploying, the display will change. You achieve this goal by inserting a new cell, period, done. You will do this and it will work. You can feel very strong about what you're writing. You're sharing your information, feel confident in it, and your reader will too. Another writing tip, you are not a robot. Use contractions. They decrease formality and they feel less stilted. This is the edit that I make more than any other edit in any blogs that I go through on all three of our websites. I start slashing and burning things that are not contractions. You will find it is not too difficult to fix this problem. You'll find it's not too difficult to fix this problem. Keep in mind that blogging is a conversation. It's very informal. You're not writing a thesis for college and you're not you know, writing your, your PhD dissertation. It, you can be very informal and speak directly to someone. We use contractions when we're speaking. We should also use contractions when we're writing blogs. Um, lastly, uh, it's, it's there, 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 your, your. If you don't know what the stuff means in this blue, go look it up. Internalize it. Uh, these are contractions that are very, very frequently misused, and there are lots of people out on the internet that are going to judge you for misusing them. I recognize that as a personal grammarian, this is not something that uh, everybody understands. It's not necessarily inherent. However, you should learn it. If you're not sure about it, post it on your wall. Make sure that you commit these things to memory. All right, use first and second person uh, point of view. You want to speak directly to the reader. You're a person and she's a person. Like I said, it's a conversation. And uh, here's an example here. The developer will find the solution helpful. This happens a lot in the blogs that I edit. We refer to the developer, who happens to be the reader, in the third person. Just to go back, first person is I, and second person is you. I think you'll find the solution helpful. I am a person, I'm writing, I'm sharing this solution with you, the reader. Have a conversation. Link to internal pages. This is a really easy tip. Um, sometimes it's difficult to remember the first time you're writing when you do your second edit, because we should always edit our own work. Go back and make sure that you're aiding the re reader in solving their problem. This also improves the bounce rate, and that improves uh, your search engine optimization. Incidentally, linking the word within the text itself actually results in a higher click-through than the blog's related link speed. So anytime that you're posting something, that you're referring to a, a product or a post or anything else that also is on your website, be sure to link it. If you're referring, the nice thing with the web is that you don't even have to list all of your references at the bottom. You can just link it directly to whatever your external reference is even. And the whole key here is don't make me think. We've been hearing that for years and years with the internet. It's still true. Don't make somebody think. Don't make somebody go look for something. If uh, you do work for a company, make sure that you check your company's usage guidelines. Brand names often have a long name and a short name, so find out when and how you should use them. My rule that I use is the long name with hyperlink in the very first reference, and then I use the short unlinked name following that, and then I link the final reference if it's below the scroll. So in the, t in the uh, case of my own company, we have Component 1 Studio, WinForms Edition is the long name. WinForms or WinForms Edition is the short name. So I use Component 1 Studio WinForms Edition in my first mention, and then in my last mention, I might use WinForms Edition, but I also link that one. So when in doubt, check the website. If you don't have usage guidelines that are published, published and distributed by your marketing or, or whoever's in charge of that stuff, just go and check the external website. That's been probably audited and edited, and, and that's going to tell you what you should be doing. End with a call to action. This is a huge deal. It excites the reader. It makes them feel involved. 
It allows them to continue the conversation. It doesn't just end it with the end of the blog. And it allows us to direct the user's journey. I've done a lot of usability tests. And in several of them, I've had people look at a design and say, I don't know what you want me to do right now. Because remember, don't make me think. What, what don't make me think means is you do the thinking for me. Tell me where I'm supposed to go. Calls to action tell people where they're supposed to go, and they can make a decision about whether they're going to use it. Here's some great examples for calls to action that you can use. You can download something, read more about the topic. Often I link to, tagged, uh, to a tag within the blog so they can see everything that's related to that tag. Leave me your comments. You've seen that in uh, blogs all over the place. Take a survey, try a demo, buy, call a sales associate. These are all things that you can write. Make sure that they're linked, of course. Let them continue the conversation. And when we're having a release, I create a code block that you see right here. This is an example. And I send it to all of our bloggers and say, can you please make sure that you include this in the bottom of all your blogs? Because we're doing a very spe a specific campaign right now to push our most recent version. So please just uh, put this at the bottom. It's got the download. It's got the purchase. It's got the login. All of your calls to action are baked right in. OK, we're going to move on to SEO now optimizing your post search profile because just because you post something doesn't mean anyone's going to show up to the party. So first we're going to talk about keywords. You've probably heard the word keywords many times. It's in reference to Google uh, Analytics and Google search engine optimization. So keywords are search terms that should match primary concepts on your page. And there are predictions for how the user searches for and finds our page, not necessarily what the company calls it, that said, a little branding is always nice. So here's, here's my rule with this. Branding will happen in your blog. If you're with the company and you want to make sure that you're inserting the name of your product wherever you go, that's not a bad idea, but that's going to happen naturally. You'll be able to use the brand name in that first and last mention. It's going to show up just the way that you want to. You want to make sure that you're going to use the non-branded keywords to attract the people who don't know that your grid is called FlexGrid, who don't know that it's called Component One Studio WinForms Edition. They just call it WinForms. They just call it a data grid. So those are keywords that make sense to them. And here's the key. You have to be where they're looking for you. If somebody is looking for flowers, make sure that you're where they're looking for flowers, and that's right next to the church. Okay, so we're going to start with the search terms when we're talking about SEO. So along the left side, and in the left column here under, under the unlikely search, these are the names of controls and very specific brand names for things that we have within our company, FlexGrid for NBC, DataGrid for WPF. These are easy keywords, right? Everybody knows what these are, except not everybody knows what a FlexGrid is. That doesn't necessarily make sense to everyone as much as we would like to think that they do. They probably don't. So we want to get to the people who haven't heard of FlexGrid. And therefore, we should be getting to the people who want to edit cells in an MVC grid, because that's what people search for. Sorting and editing grids, WPF. What we have on the right here is the actual problem you're trying to solve within your blog. What we have on the left are the means to that solution. You always want to make sure that you're coming from the point of the problem, not the means to the solution. And you have to think outside the brand in order to do that. Think about how you search for things, and then apply that to your blog. HTML tags matter. This is kind of a maintenance thing. Excuse me, I'm going to sip some tea. So if you're not the person that is actually programming the, the infrastructure of the blog, go find them and make sure that they understand the cardinal rule of subheads for SEO. And that's if it's in an H tag, the search engine will find it. Now, any SEO expert with their salt will certainly tell you that they don't have any hard and fast answers as to what Google actually does with H tags. We know that they matter more than something that's in a paragraph tag. We don't know how much more they matter. But make sure that your headline is in an H tag. Make sure that you have some attractive versions of H2, H3, and H4 to be able to include, include within the body of it because those matter to, uh, to Google and those are going to boost your SEO. Create compelling headlines. So in addition to everything we just talked about in the previous section about your writing skill and who you're writing to. We also can maximize our SEO within, or optimize our SEO within the compelling headline. So match likely keywords. Remember what I just mentioned about edit cells and NBC grid. Include verbs and imperative actions. I always like, I often like starting with a verb because that's 
moving things forward, that's impelling somebody to do something. If you want to give it a clever name, you can use a colon, like uh, MVC FlexGrid colon, how to edit cells, something along those lines. Uh, your users want to know why they should spend time on your post, so you need to make sure that you're telling them that in the headline, and we'll get to some examples in a minute. A fun clue from HubSpot here, 11 to 13 word headlines get the most visits. We don't know why, I'm not entirely sure why, except that apparently it gets that keyword, it gets that why you should spend time, what you're doing, what's your problem, how am I going to solve it. So here's some magic words also from HubSpot. How is a great way to, uh, to, to get people to click into your post numbers and lists. There's a reason that BuzzFeed is so very popular, 10 reasons to listen to my podcast today. Your Again, we're speaking directly to someone, and best, because that's always a good way to attract attention, is to say that you're the best. And just think about this. Imagine how your headline will look in Google, and that's what you should think about your headline being. So here's some examples of headlines. These are real headlines from our, uh, our blog that I've worked on and edited. So version number one, FlexGrid Tag Helper working with cell templates. So instantly, I have several questions about this. What are cell templates, and why do I want to work with them? What's a flex grid? What's a tag helper? Why do I care about them? And why do I care about any of this? Now, if I already know what a flex grid is, then I might care. If I know what a tag helper is, I might care a little bit. If I know what a cell template, cell template is, I might care about it. But once I actually dug into the blog post itself, I discovered what, what it was really about is how to insert a chart into a grid cell with tag helpers and flex grid. So even if I don't know what tag helpers are, or if I don't know what flex, flex grid is, I know that they help me insert a chart into a grid cell, which is something that a lot of people will want to do. And the thing that people will probably search for is how do I insert a chart into a grid cell? So it's right there in the headline. Here are some more headline examples. Working with financial chart. What's a financial chart besides a chart for finances, I think, and why do I need to work with it? Uh, so we updated that to working with financial charts, simple candlesticks, legends, markers, trend lines, and annotations. It's a mouthful to say out loud, but those are all very specific words that will have resonance with people who are working with charts, specifically working with financial charts, trend lines and annotations, huge deal. We provide those things. Now they're going to know that right in the headline. And so what they're seeing is, oh, okay, you have candlestick charts, great, I need those, and I need trend lines, we have all those things, this is something I'm going to click into. Okay, now we're going to talk about subheads. We've got here um, my favorite example of block of text, lore mipsum. So subheads create a more scannable experience for the reader. If you see this, this block of text on the right, it'll probably make about as much sense to you as Lorem Ipsum does, and you're going to think, I have to have hours to be able to read this. So being able to have subheads lets you scan down and decide what you're going to read first. It increases the reading pace by imparting the upcoming value to the reader. So even if they think, oh, I don't have time to finish reading this, oh, I'm interested in that next subhead, I'm going to keep reading. It reduces large text blocks. Again, it just doesn't feel so intimidating for people. And again, it improves the SEO. It allows you to include keywords in those uh, all-important H tags. So one way to use subheads to boost SEO, uh, you could have a subhead that just says maps. You could also say map geographic data with zoom, pan, and pins in the event that somebody is searching for zoom or pan or pins in relationship to a map. Now, feedback that I got um, when I was giving this uh, presentation previously is that, well, we don't want to sound too salesy. And that is certainly a problem, especially when you're talking to um, a group as cynical as developers can often be. But it, if you can give more info without being sal salesy about it, then do it. It's not going to hurt. And my basic pattern for creating a subhead is do this great thing. You don't have to say why, you don't have to do all these things, it's just this is a great thing that you can do, I assume that you already know why it's a big deal because you're already reading my blog, and then the implication is I'm going to tell you how to do that in the next paragraph. So I would not recommend that we use these subheads. Um, I see these crop up a lot, especially introduction and conclusion. Um, and I would say if you have the urge to use any of these subheads, use them in conjunction with some useful keywords like conclusion, customizing cells is easy with FlexGrid, that kind of thing. Now, I've, gotten, I've also gotten feedback on this that some people really like having introduction and conclusion in, their, uh, in the blog post that they read because they can skip to the bottom and see what the actual conclusion is. And if that's the case, that's fine. Use conclusion. Just make sure that you're giving it a, maybe a little bit of context because it couldn't hurt to do that. 
Again, we want to avoid being salesy, but we also want to make sure that people are getting what they want to get out of that blog and that they know immediately what they're going to be reading in a moment. Um, plus, when you have subheads like the word example, if anybody searches for the word example, they're not necessarily going to be wanting to look at your blog. So that's pumping up your SEO with a lot of words that don't directly apply to your blog post alone. And that could potentially falsely boost your SEO, which means that's going to boost your bounce rate because somebody's going to click into it and then click right back out of it again. All right, include images and screenshots. This is a huge deal. Um, it increases searchable text on the page, first of all. Um, how does it do that? I'll show you in a minute. It also uh, shows the user what the final product will look like. It walks them through the steps of a process so they know they're on the right track, which is really great. It also breaks up the text so it doesn't feel like you're reading as much. Posts, you can also use it to inject humor or illustrate a concept. Posts that have images perform much better than posts without. Always include images, especially screenshots, if you're trying to uh, describe a particular procedure or process that's happening within your code and your uh, controls. So increase the amount of searchable text. How does an image actually do that? So the image itself is not searchable by an SEO bot, but the file name is. So instead of just calling it something generic like Excel screenshot, you could call it Component 1 Studio Flexi for WPF. Now granted, you might not want to spend time doing that for every single one of your images, like ahead of time when you, before you upload them to WordPress, but you can use the alt and title text. You can also update the names of the files that people are downloading. And this is a good way to combine branding with the keywords in your alt and title tag. So you can see in, here, in this case the alt tag, when you hover over this, it says Wijmo Financial Chart, Simple, Haken, Ashy Chart. Now, Wijmo Financial Chart is a brand. Again, this is how I was saying that brands are going to happen naturally. You don't have to pump uh, the brand name necessarily in your headline. So this is a natural place for that to occur. But Haken Ashy Chart is a very specific term to financial charts, and that's something that people are going to be searching for. So that's another good way to, to pump up the, the searchable text on your page. And captions, you can also include captions, so that also increases the searchable text on your page, it reinforces your message, you can even inject a little bit of humor with it. So uh, we're developers, what does that mean? We're probably writing technical blogs, technical blogs means code snippets. So definitely use your special language tags. Experiment with the particular blog platform that you have to ensure uh, which of these appears the best. Um, we often use just the code brackets. Um, any of these other ones will also work. Just, again, experiment with it. Do lots of previews. Make sure that it looks good. Always include proper indentation. Uh, nobody likes messy code, and you especially don't want messy code in a blog post. Insert it into the text tab. Um, I'm not sure about other blog platforms, but we use WordPress, and it can drive you to distraction. If you try to insert code into the HTML or visual tab of WordPress, often your code will just go away into the ether and it will disappear and you'll never get it back. So my, uh, my advice is always to start with the text tab, and then when you're copying out of some, uh, your IDE, like Visual Studio, copy it, copy it into, uh, paste it into Notepad, copy it from Notepad, and then copy it into the text window. That's the likeliest way to get just your code with the indentations in the way that you want it to appear. So use long tail tags. What is a long tail tag? That's the search query that readers would enter to find your post most useful. So this is a frequent uh, tags. These are frequent tags that I see on our blog posts. Uh, C1 Excel, Excel, Excel file features. Now the whole point of doing a tag is to amp up your SEO. Another possible use for tags is internal taxonomy. In other words, um, I have like a 2015 V2 tag so that we have everything that we released in V2 available under one tag. I don't have to create a whole new category for it. So that's fine. That's a perfectly reasonable way to use tags as taxonomy, but that is not the real power in tags. The real power in tags is being able to add all of these different permutations of the search terms. And this is actually what is powering a lot of Google right now. Long tail tags are getting pushed really hard um, and a lot with a lot of search engine optimization because this is what people are finding. If you enter Excel as a tag and someone searches Excel, what is the likelihood that they actually want to find your post on um, 
exporting your grid to Excel. It's fairly unlikely. They're probably looking to buy Excel or something along those lines. So that means your, your bounce rate's going to go up. What you want to do is say, okay, create Excel documents on the fly. That is a search term that someone is going to enter into Google. In fact, that's a search term that if you started entering into Google, it would probably start finishing it for you because enough people might actually search for it. That's what you want to think about when you're creating your tags. Specificity helps. Don't be afraid to be specific. When I'm creating long tail tags, I go through the entire post and I start looking at each paragraph. What is the thing that they're telling me to do? What is the problem that they're solving? They're adding page breaks and wind forms. They're adding sheets to wind forms. They're adding comments in Excel. These are all the things that I want to add as tags. Okay, a lot of uh, blog platforms allow you to add an excerpt. The excerpt is what shows up usually in Google search or your search engine that um, is isn't in the actual search results. My recommendation here is to give the answer, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, give the answer to your problem, not the uh, introduction to your blog post. That is something I see a lot of people doing. So they'll add their whole first paragraph into the excerpt. When really what we should be doing is saying, create Excel workbooks on the fly with Component with Studio Excel for .NET with WinForms. So what that's telling us, excuse me, is exactly what the user is going to be able to do. So if someone just searched for, how do I create Excel workbooks in WinForms, they're going to see this show up in their search results and know instantly that that's exactly the answer that they want. Why is that useful? Because if somebody searched for how do I buy Excel and this comes up, they won't click into our post, which is a good thing because that means only the people who are actually going to get value from our post are clicking into it. It's going to lower our bounce rate. It's going to improve the performance on the actual website because they're going to be able to click through and it's an actual real marketing lead. These are people who are interested in what, we're, what our product is. And a good format for the excerpt is what are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? So what? Create workbooks, Excel workbooks. Why are we doing it on the fly, quickly? Why, why do we want to do this? Because I think that that's probably implied. And how? With Component 1 Studio, yada, yada, yada. All right, lastly, publishing and promoting. Uh, you want to publish it? You should tell people about it. So when should you publish? Um, check with marketing if they do actually have a schedule, an editorial calendar for blog posts. Make sure that we're not posting a whole bunch on the same day. If anybody is actually subscribing to your blog, blog posts will get pushed down immediately. We don't necessarily want that to happen. So there's a website called coschedule.com that has some times that they recommend for when to, to publish. I think the time for when to publish is not nearly as important as the number of posts on one day and when you promote it. Because unless somebody is really clicking into your blog a lot and following it very, very closely, which I think for a lot of technical blogs is not necessarily the case, promoting it is really what the big deal is. Um, if you're HuffPost, you can worry about what time you want to post. If you're only posting two, two posts a day or four posts a week, I wouldn't worry quite so much about what time of day as when to actually post your, your tweets. So self-promotion never hurts. Um, find out if you should be using UTM tracking, which actually stands for Urchin Tracking Model, Module. And what that is, is anytime that you share a post on Facebook and you look at the URL and it says something like UTM underscore source equals blah, blah, UTM underscore content equals blah, blah, blah. What that does is it allows whoever is tracking Google Analytics to track campaigns and to see, okay, when I posted this blog post, it generated this many hits to this page on our website, for instance. Or you can also uh, have different UTM tracking codes at the top and the bottom of your page, even if they're going to the same destination. Why does that matter? Because then that can tell you, oh, if I do a call to action at the bottom, it actually gets more hits than if I just link something in the text at the top of the page. So it's a good way to do a little bit of experimentation. Always use the Google URL shortener, especially with Twitter. You have a limited number of characters you can use, so the Google URL shortener can be a lifesaver as far as that goes. Always at your company. If you're referring to like a bigger company like Microsoft or Visual Studio, it doesn't hurt to at them as well as long as it's relevant to them because they might retweet it for you. That's always good. And then hashtag your keywords. Don't hashtag every other word because people will immediately know that it's completely irrelevant. Hashtag the things that actually matter. 
All right, a few last words. Understand your audience. Pick one audience. Again, one audience. Is it Gonzo? Is it Miss Piggy? Who is it? Pick them, talk to them, and then think about them. What do they find annoying? How do they scan for things? What do they find most useful? And this was one of those things that I, I had mentioned earlier on about the subheads, introduction and conclusion. If, if by and large developers love having a subhead that says conclusion, then include that because that's going to help your blog. Um, but basically what you want to do with any kind of blog is balance the audience appeal and the SEO and the brand and just make sure that you have a nice balance of all three of those things along with all those nice writing tips that I had. And, and it should be a pretty successful blog. Um, Really quick note, best blogging platforms out there. There are a couple of good um, directions for that. Startablog123.com has this really terrific chart that um, gives some advice on different blogging tools. Pick the one that works best for you. And that's all. That's all that I have. Um, does anyone have any questions that you want to uh, ask within the webinar question? Okay. Well, thank you all very much for attending. This was a lot of fun. We are going to post this to our website, and I will be sure to send it to all of you um, as soon as it's available. I, it does seem that I successfully recorded it, so I'll let you all know very soon. Have a great day, and thanks for attending.